Um, just a quick note here. I would like if you have any, uh, if you're doing a talk, there's anything you don't understand, just raise your hand and I'll try to explain it. But questions would be later uh, in the talk. Um, and I have a tendency to speak really fast. So here's a new hand signal for you. If I speak too fast for you to understand, just do like this and I'll slow down. Okay? Okay. It's open for everyone. Yes, mass. So this is the uh, figure number 10, bleed in versus differentiation. Um, and it's, uh, it's a big one in the Nordic lab. We, uh, every Nordic lab has an opinion on bleed. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'll try to bring you through it as from the basis forward. Um, this fader is about the distance between player and character. If you set it to the maximum with full bleed in, it's really close to home and very thin characters, perhaps you're just playing yourself. Uh, if you set it to the zero end, you're playing something completely different from yourself. Uh, and I'll just explain that. Differentiation is, is when we play something that is clearly not ourselves. When we have a character uh, that, that, that acts independently of us and that we just don't portray. Uh, when we really feel through another person. Uh, we all know this when we laugh that we are someone else. That is a big lie, because whenever we're LARPing, uh, we keep talking about the player and the character as like the separate people, but they're not. Because every time we LARP, we're still ourselves. So this slider can never really reach zero, uh, unless we're schizophrenic. Um, right. So that takes us to the, uh, to the other end, which is where the <coughs> meat is. Bleed is when emotions and, and the experiences related to that transfer between the player and the character. It can be both positive and negative, and it can go both ways. Um, but it's basically when you sort of align your feelings with the character uh, that you're playing, or the, play the character is yeah, exactly. Now, the first way is bleed out, which is when things from the game enter you as a player. Uh, when, when the character you've been portraying affect you uh, as the player. It's often hard to see during a game because we're all portraying the characters. But it can become quite obvious after a game through certain uh, ways of acting. People can become emotionally unbalanced, have new uh, unexplained emotions after a game that sort of echo what they've been through. Sometimes people feel sad they have left the game and, and sort of miss it, uh, feel nostalgic about it. And sometimes players have a really good experience and feel connected to the other players, even though they've never actually met the player but only the character. Uh, but you can feel the real connection there. The other way to lead in, which is what this is about for you as designers mostly, is when the actions in the game are based on the player rather than the character. Uh, we tried it a bit with the, the New Voices in Art game, where the character was all based on us with a minor modification of being an artist uh, and some other changes we could add. It's also when you put something that people have a personal investment in as the subject matter of the game, uh, when it deals with something close to people. And every time you have to make a sort of ugly moral choice, you'll always end up sort of referring to your own personal morals and ethics uh, rather than the character in some degree. Right. Now the thing with bleed is, is inevitable. There will always be uh, some amount of bleed in any player at any game. Uh, because we cannot separate ourselves fully from what we're playing. It's a very individual thing. Some people have it to a great degree uh, and others not so much and the game will change how much we react to it. Uh, and some people love the feeling of, of coming together with the game and feeling in it afterwards, and, and others don't really care about it and just want to go slay dragons and have fun. Um, yes. And this, uh, this fader goes on, on several levels. You can adjust how close it is to the players themselves in, in a variety of, of settings, like, like uh, the character background. You can base characters on people, uh, their own personal experiences, um, and you can base them on how people act, their outlook, and of course, situation people are in can reflect real life uh, experiences more or less, and the place, uh, the setting that the game takes place in can also be close to uh, to natural or or further away. Um, the the slider goes from something really close to people uh, to the most fantastic games. We all like, we, we, we've tried games that are uh, really fantastic and takes place in weird settings like fantasy and science fiction uh, that are hard to sort of 
connects to your real life, but it gives a really strong potential for new experiences. And then there are the uh, Nordic favorite of close to home play, which is playing something that is every day, which is very uh, near to us, and, and that, uh, that we can really relate to easily. And this is an area where the bleed is very uh, easily attained uh, and used. And of course, you can change this fader during play. It's usually easier to build more layers of, uh, of distance during the play by adding levels of character and setting away from the natural starting point. Some of games use this uh, to remove really really <coughs> But it has a lot of impact if you move it the other way, where people experience something in a fantastic setting, uh, some, something very far from them, and then suddenly realize that it's actually parallel to something they've experienced themselves. Setting this uh, fader is about two things. It's one about... Oh, it's a bit too fast. <laughs> too fast, yes. It's a bit more slow. I will try to be slower. <laughs> right. Now, this, uh, this fader is about two things. One is the effort made by the player in immersing themselves into the character and, and, and playing that character and the setting of the game. The other is what you gain from the, from the game compared... Uh, yeah. What are you now, when assuming the character, it's usually faster and easier to just play yourself. Um, when, when we play something more difficult, it takes more of a challenge to play something far from ourselves. But part of that challenge can be a really fun part of role playing, and, and, and that's one of the things I enjoy myself, most myself, is trying to push who I can be in games. Um, yes. And this is also a factor in the sort of length of games and the time of how much time for preparation the players have. Because the longer a game runs, the closer the player and character usually get together. Uh, you might start out playing very differently, but as, if the game is several days, you will sort of glide into being more yourself. Why? Because um, it's been hard to maintain uh, something far from yourself, and you'll have a lot of input that you react naturally to. Um, but then again, uh, a very different character view is, takes time and effort to get into before the game and at the start of it. So it could be too much for a short game to ask people to play someone very different from themselves. And there's the thing called the hollow man, which is that if we don't have enough character as players, we'll fill in with ourselves. Um, if a game is, is, uh, is set so that there's no description of the character and who, what they're like. We'll just sort of put details from our own life or, or people close to us and use that as the, as the fill-in for the character in the background. Uh, so if you don't give your players time and input to create characters that are different from themselves, they will be playing themselves uh, to a large part. Uh, and it also happens during a game if they expect to be playing one thing and it changes. For example, the teenagers you know, having a, a, a uh, a trip to a cabin in the woods, drinking and, and making out with each other and everything. <coughs> and when the zombies attack, which the players didn't expect, they'll not react as the characters as much as they'll react as themselves being scared of this new thing entering the game. Right. Um, now, setting the, the, the fader in different positions will also change what comes out of the game for the players. Uh, each has its own benefits and dangers. When we play very far from ourselves, we'll get a lot of new experiences we wouldn't otherwise get. We get to play fantastic things and learn about other places and other times that we wouldn't really have a chance to feel in the same way in normal life. We can be anyone we want to be if we just apply ourselves hard enough. We can do things we wouldn't normally be allowed to or able to do in full hour. But it can be a bit sort of abstract and, 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 and hard to, to use for yourself afterwards what you learn in these sort of games. Unless you... Uh, Take the time afterwards. With bleed, it's about immediate identification between you and the character and the situation. It's very easy if you're playing close to yourself to see how the things in the LARP uh, will affect you as a person and, and how you are as a person. Uh, and that's part of the stuff that makes LARP a really powerful medium for communication because it provides these powerful experiences that are very close to yourself and very personal. But that closeness can also go too far. And more of that later. Right now, let's say that, that when it comes to learning through LARPing, the less distance between the, pl uh, the, the player and the character, the more personal the experience will be. And it'll give you some insights into yourself as a player 
or a situation you are in yourself. But if you play something different, you'll get new perspectives on a situation. Um, and in any case, it's very important that you, as, as, as organizers, during the debrief, make sure that people sort of get to reflect on what they've been through and take some, some of the right lessons from it. So this is also why you can use LARP or role-playing in, in therapy, uh, in psychology or education. You can use setting up people in situations from their own uh, personal history and play through them again with new outcomes or playing the, the, the opposite character and something to hurt you and realize how this uh, fits together. It's a powerful tool for healing uh, and then again that makes it dangerous as well. So we have to be really careful and responsible about it. Uh, which, which we've learned the hard way in the, in the Nordic lab <coughs> scene. Uh, yes. Now, when you create these games that have a high emotional content, uh, which they easily do if you put the right issues online, and you play people really close to themselves, they have to be very, very safe, feeling very safe um, as players outside of the game, uh, with each other and with the, the game and you as organizers. You have to provide a really big amount of trust between them during the warm-up and workshop, if possible, and you have to take care of them after the game, through debriefings and talking to people and perhaps even a party if that's the way of doing it. And be aware that this can happen to anyone in any game. You never ever know what could trigger uh, bleeding. You could be, you could be playing, in a, in a, playing a night in a fantasy game and suddenly stumble upon something that, that touches you and you have to deal with it as a player. And if you as organizers are aware of this happening, you can help people through it and, and make them uh, feel better about the experience rather than feeling hurt. Uh, and this all hinges on the role-playing contract which has been mentioned before, which is basically that we're all just pretending and you can't judge me on my character's actions in the game. It's also called the magic circle. This gives the players a safe space to act more dramatically and, and more vulnerably than they would in the real world <coughs> through the excuse of having a character that are, is acting for them. But the less of a character you have, the less this sort of contract is true. So if you move people really close to themselves, and, and deal with emotional issues, you have to be aware that the trust will sometimes fail uh, and you have to build extra layers of that on top of the game. Right. This is the, the big warning here. When you deal with really serious issues, the kind that are painful to people through past experiences or, or things they've witnessed uh, in their real life, sometimes they don't even know that they have these issues. But if you put them in the game, it might trigger a reaction from them sudden memories and flashbacks and emotions that come from what you put in the game. This is especially for inexperienced players who don't know how strong LARP is, and how much of an emotional reaction you get from it, and have no idea what to do afterwards with these new sort of emotions bubbling up. And some of these, uh, yes? Uh, that's my answer to this. Okay. <laughs> some of these areas here are, uh, are all the touchy subjects that we don't really want to talk about. But we can usually we can put them in LARPs for a very strong experience for most people and use them as therapy for people who are already affected by it if we're very responsible. Uh, there are favorites in the Nordic uh, game scene to put this sort of stuff in games. But if you put it in, people might get hurt if, the, if, they, if they hear it. These are things like any kind of sexual trauma or abuse, anything like that. Will, there will be someone out there who has had a similar experience and will trigger on it. Um, Gender identity issues, homosexuality, and, and gender roles. Uh, the game is about being a real man. Some players might actually be hurt by, by failing at that. Um, any kind of psychological or physical torment of your players will be, uh, will be very dangerous, especially the psychological kind, uh, because you don't realize how hard it is. And some players have uh, a real fear of losing either control or power, uh, even for their fictional characters, that can have them become very hurt and, and and backed out. Yes? Can I come with an example? You may. Um, I was doing a workshop for a, a game called System Denmark, <coughs> and in that workshop we made a frozen moment, like I did earlier, with a car crash. And it was just a fictional car crash, but suddenly one of the participants went out the door crying. 
and we had pushed on something that her parents had died in a car crash, and none of us knew. There's just this can come up at any yes. time. Playing with the fiction, fictional uh, situations, you can push upon something without even knowing. So if you put anything like this in your game, you have to make damn sure that your players know beforehand that it will be in there. Don't ever put this in as a surprise or, or a secret uh, without the players knowing that it might be in the game. And you need to provide players with a chance to back out once they realize these things are in, without losing anything, the cost of the game or the time or the effort. And you have to make sure they do it in private, because nobody will back down in front of a group uh, if, they have the, if they have the choice. It's very, it's very hard for them to do that. So make sure it's, it can happen in private before they have invested too much into the game. So be upfront about these things if you put them in your games. Right. Uh, that was the big warning I had. Now I'll just give an example of these bleep things, because they're sort of diffuse, which is my own experience at Capital. I was a prisoner X88 for the full 48 hours of the game. Um, <coughs> this is about my sort of story and how the bleed affected it. For the first six hours of the game, it was fun. I was in a prison camp, the scenography was awesome. I had awesome co-players, it was dramatic and powerful, and I got to be mean to people in new ways. But, <laughs> we're Nordics, we love this. After 12 hours, <coughs> the being mean uh, sort of started getting really hard. I was sort of, it was not fun anymore, it was just something I had to do in order to sort of stay alive in the camp and then and be on top. It was really, I was running out of ideas through my character, what to do, and I started sort of using my own personal ideas of what would hurt in the game. That was when I was bleeding into the character for myself, because I was sort of forced to use my own ways of being cruel to people. And that was very scary when I realized this uh, in the game, that suddenly I was, this isn't my character being mean, now I'm just mean myself. Um, after 18 hours, I was cold, I was wet, and I was kind of hungry. Um, it wasn't too bad, but it was getting to me, and I was sort of losing my ability to play the character. And I was reacting more and more as myself. It was a horrible situation where I had to be a horrible person. It was really bad, and I could sort of feel myself uh, straining. And I t told myself, you now have six hours left of the game if you don't feel any better. As I said, you'll le I'll leave the game if I don't get out of this horrible situation in six hours. Then what happened is that about halfway through the game, my true love entered into the camp. And the entry scene for new prisoners was horrible. They were screamed at and beaten and, and torn apart. And I just saw her go through this and it was horrible. And then of course we came into the camp and we played and we had wonderful romantic relations. Lots of emotions because of the pressures of the camp, we couldn't be together and stuff. But of course, we're Nordics, so after about 36 hours it was all tragedy. We'd broken up and we'd done horrible stuff to each other and been really mean and everything was uh, angry. Uh, and in the end, we sort of got back together again. We had a beautiful exit when she had to leave the camp and I was left sitting there at the end thinking around the doors. And then the, the organizers rolled up the big gate at the end of the game and let the sunlight into this otherwise dark camp and I was just, my emotions just exploded all over the place. I had all the emotions I have had during the game at the same time. I was angry, I threw a crowbar through a, a plaster wall and started crying and when I saw the organizers I didn't know if I were going to fight them or hug them. Uh, it was really, really, yeah, I was sort of out of control that for about 15 minutes there. But the game had a really good debrief, we had a long talk with some of the other players and uh, I talked with the girl who played my romantic relation there for several hours, just putting the whole thing into back into the game so it wouldn't hang out afterwards and yeah, it was, uh, it was, yes, money? Yeah, uh, anyway, and, and, and the game also had a very good system of, of a sort of debrief buddy that I talked to for about two months afterwards, about every 14 days, we had a nice talk about what had happened in the game and how it was coming out. But the thing that struck me the most was this. For about the two weeks after the game, my emotions were running on autopilot. I was sort of thinking about the, the, thinking about the game as a game. It was a fun, ex fun experience, and it was, it was a way. But my emotions were still going through the relationship. Uh, sort of the emotional side of my, of my brain was, for the first couple of days, just feeling really warm and fuzzy and in love. Like, oh, this is so nice. I really love this. And then for a couple of days, I sort of, I sort of felt really satisfied. Like, oh, I have something nice in my life. It's really warm. Was good, and then it was hard. 
just turned into heartbreak. I'm like, oh, I'm so alone. I miss her. It's horrible. And it wasn't the girl who played the character, though she's really nice. It was for the character who never really existed in the first place. And I knew that this was because of the game, so I could sort of ignore it. But if I had been an inexperienced player, which I have experienced similar things when I was younger, it would have completely ruined my life. I would have gone after this girl, would have run to Stockholm where she lived and professed my love to her and, 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 and sold all my belongings just to get the plane tickets uh, because it was so strong. But because I had been debriefed properly and I knew that it was, this was likely to happen, I could sort of put it aside. But it was there and it was very powerful. Yes. Would you say that at the 24 hour mark that you got back into character with that entrance? Because yes. It seems like you're telling the story like you've got. You were in game and then you started being you. Yes. And then the thing that happened was when she entered, the relationship sort of rebooted the character. Because playing the relation to her was about the character's uh, love for her. So I had, had, I had a new strong connection that sort of was stronger than feeling wet and, and annoyed and, and angry <laughs> that I could focus on, which brought me back into the game. Yes. Right. And that was uh, my side of this uh, two-part mixing desk talk. And again, this is about the distance between the player and character. Be careful when you reduce the distance, because that's where the really powerful stuff is, but also the really dangerous stuff. Yes. Ooh.